Hi everyone, this is Lee Perry here with my dear friend Sean Patton, who if any of you know me, you know that I speak very highly of his organization called Stocking Savvy. And um, you also know about this video blog adventure that I'm planning right now where I really wanna help individuals who either buy property or live on property that they can uh, steward a relationship with nature on their property. I really wanna help people understand where to go from a certain starting point. And Sean here is a very uh, well-connected, very informed, consultant who does shoreline projects and helps completely remediate um, our water bodies across the state by using really awesome multimodal aquatic practices. So, Sean, welcome. Thank you, Lee. It's always good to be out here. And I always appreciate the work that you do both personally through Ideas for Us, and it's kind of cool to see your own property. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that I talk about is if it's not a native plant, and it's not an edible plant to really think hard about if or even why it needs to be planted. And one of the big things, it's a huge problem for Florida, are invasive species. And so one of the most common invasive species that you'll see is the Brazilian pepper. So these guys are actually growing on this water line between your property. And the reason invasive species are bad is they will fill in large areas, they'll block out all the natives, they'll kill out the understory, and they oftentimes are not usable by people or the native wildlife. And so Brazilian peppers like this one here are one of the most invasive species in Florida. And so you can see that this guy has leaflets in sets of five or seven and large clumps of red berries. And oftentimes they'll have poisonous sticky sap that can give you an allergic reaction if, say, you're allergic to poison sumacs. So one of the big things that I advise is don't plant these invasive species or anything that's not native or edible. In fact, two out of every three invasive species come from homeowners' yards. So this is a great way that you can not only help reduce your tax money, but get more productivity out of your land for both yourself and feeding yourselves and also for protecting the wildlife because there are no animals that are native to Florida that can really use this. Some people talk about how honeybees can use the pepper trees for honey, but many other bees can't. And those honeybees can nectar at any flower almost. Mm -hmm. So be sure whenever you're doing any gardens to not plant invasives and only use natives or edibles. Yeah, so when I acquired this land back in April of 2021, I did a full assessment, walked around, took notes of what is living here and what is not. And now I'm calling on different experts in the community to kind of share what they do and then also some advice to give the average homeowner or resident that wants to do something like plant a shoreline or uh, combat some of the invasives in their, uh, on their property. So Sean, here we are. We have Stocking Savvy here. What's one of the first things that you're looking at when you come to a place that has water on its property? And what are some of the first advice tips that you give to the average person? So the first advice that I give to people who live near aquatic shorelines is to plant native plants. In fact, three of the most invasive aquatic plants in Florida are all water plants. Water hyacinth, hydrilla, and Brazilian pepper all prefer these aquatic environments. And this is so difficult to deal with. We spend literally billions of tax dollars and homeowners spend many, many more millions mm -hmm. dealing with these invasive species. And for every invasive species that you can think of, there's a native species that is slower growing or oftentimes edible. If you saw that Brazilian pepper earlier, then, and you like the look, in fact, it used to be a very common ornamental plant, but is now federally banned, so don't plant it. I got my glasses on you. <laughs> plant the Dahoon holly. It gets the same clumps of red berries, has a similar leaf shape, grows in aquatic environments, mm -hmm. and looks very pretty, but unlike the Brazilian pepper, doesn't spread nearly as fast, so you're not spending as much time or maintenance on it. Mm -hmm. Another great thing, thing to plant near aquatic environments are aquatic plants. So these guys, this is a maidenhair fern. This is a much shadier backyard, so I wanted to bring an example fern. Maidenhair ferns, native sword ferns, swamp ferns, all the way up to the giant 10, 11 foot tall leather ferns are all excellent plants to have in these shadier areas. If you wanted a little bit of color, Stokes Aster is good, but the plants we're gonna be talking about today are more of the winter and year round bloomers. We'll be doing a special in the spring on all the other beautiful aquatic plants we'll see then, but plant plants everywhere. 
If you have a shoreline, you wanna plant the entire thing. You wanna plant plants in the water. You wanna have plants on land. And in fact, if you are planting in the water, don't be afraid to have lily pads. And you want these plants to not only help add space for birds, butterflies, and bees, and in fact, I am writing a book on aquatic butterfly gardening, which will be out next year, and it's gonna be very exciting, so follow us for more information on that. But you can also do things like aquatic permaculture. Mm -hmm. Elderberry is one of my favorite edible plants. You can make jams, wines, and liqueurs from the plant. It's native, and it grows very well on aquatic shorelines. There's also a wide variety of lettuces that do well on shorelines, um, pickerel weeds and canna lilies that do well, and many of them have edible parts. And so you can make beautiful edible gardens alongside these waterways or just have a nice lush shoreline of plants. Mm -hmm. Not only does this help provide habitat and food, but you can also reduce shoreline erosion, help fight red tide by filtering the nutrients that might run off from your garden or other street areas. And you can also reduce sedimentation, which fills in your pond faster. You can rebuild those nice shallow bank slopes. So plant plants everywhere. It's one of the best things you can do for the environment. Beautiful. Now, I will say one of the main reasons why I want to invest in my shoreline and in this project and consulting with you with Stocking Savvy is because mosquito control and also water quality issues. So maybe you can talk a little bit about some of these plants that you brought here today and how they help build that ecosystem of even predatory insects that are gonna fight against some of the bad bugs. Certainly, and in fact, you picked up a great plant. So you all might be wondering, Sean, why did you bring a drought-loving scorpion's tail, which is this beautiful beach and dune plant, to talk about freshwater restoration? That doesn't make much sense. Well, these guys are one, a beautiful winter blooming plant and they bloom year round, but two, one of the best ways to actually help your water bodies is to not use as much water. And so scorpion's tail is one of a wide number of plants that are useful for drought tolerant landscaping. You don't have to be eating every inch of your yard. In fact, these guys being year round bloomers attract a lot of the small butterflies um, that will help pollinate your crops. They also attract a lot of the insect eating wasps, not the ones that sting you, um, but a lot of these small insect eating wasps that can help eat your cat, the caterpillars that you don't want, like the tomato hornworms. They'll also help eat mosquitoes. And in fact, one of the best ways ah, to control mosquitoes is to remove open sources of water and make sure that you have fish and insects in your ponds that eat mosquitoes. Um, mm -hmm. Mosquito fish are something you can get from your local mosquito control department and they're very useful. Bat boxes are something that you can buy from local organizations and you can put them up near your house. They'll also help get bats out of your attic, which is good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. bats are excellent at eating them. But the single best way to control mosquitoes is actually dragonflies. The aquatic dragonfly larva eats the, uh, eats the aquatic mosquitoes and the adult dragonfly eats the adult mosquito. But if you spray copper sulfate in your ponds or any copper products, that kills all the invertebrates. Now, mosquitoes come back in less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. Dragonflies can take several years. Mm -hmm. So if you're spraying copper, usually on a monthly basis, you're gonna keep having mosquito and midge fly problems, but you're not gonna get all the predators and things that eat those mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So be sure to reduce how much herbicide and chemical that you're using to treat your lakes and stock more algae eating fish or just harvest out any algae that you're having issues with. And Stocking Savvy is always here to help people do that. And the single best way to help reduce those algae blooms and this poor water quality that we're seeing all over Florida, which keep in mind, all this water flows out to the bays and estuaries and feeds red tide, is to not fertilize, plant lots of plants to act as a filter and a buffer, and to reduce how much water you're using on lawns and golf courses and things. Mm -hmm. That helps to recharge our aquifers and keep our groundwater flowing well. Mm -hmm. Well, let's chat a little bit about some of the other plants that you brought us here. So tell us more ah, about this one. So, ooh, this pot is a nice mixed pot with a few different natives that I wanted to talk about. So one of my favorite natives is the mist flowers. These guys are just small seasonal bloomers in the fall and spring. And these guys are just excellent for a wide variety of pollinators. Then you also have the red tropical sages. This guy did not do too well when I traveled him all the way across the coast to get here. But these guys come in red, pink, and white bloom year round and are excellent for hummingbirds and other pollinators. Mm -hmm. Florida has over 2,000 species of native plants and many of them are unique to the state, like this one. This is the previously endangered Kunti plant. Now what a lot of people don't realize is that if you don't plant native plants, you don't get the birds, butterflies, and bees. My motto is if it's not native and it's not edible, why plant it? 
and you need some of these native plants to help pollinate your crops, to help provide um, food for wildlife, and especially a lot of the carnivorous wildlife, like the spiders and wasps and things that will help keep your garden looking nice and kill all those mosquitoes and caterpillars and pest plants. But this guy is also the host plant for the Atala butterfly which is a beautiful black and red and blue butterfly that almost was extinct due to habitat loss because this plant was almost killed out of Florida. But the beautiful thing about this plant is that it's no longer endangered because people plant it everywhere. Mm -hmm. You can do backyard habitat restoration and help bring back endangered species. In fact, in my own backyard, not much different than this, I've had over 30 different species of butterfly 25 different species of bee. Yeah, there's more than just the honeybee. I've had over 25 species of bee, including three butterflies on the endangered species list, including the mallow scrub hair streak, which eats my tea bush. There's so many different plants and with over 2000 native plants, 400 found nowhere else. Why would you want a yard that looks like New York or Chicago or South America or Asia when you could have a brilliantly unique Florida yard filled with delicious food and wonderful native plants. Yeah, anybody who puts a plant in the ground is a hero to me. And I just have to say that, you know, we should be trying to go out of our way to rehabilitate the spaces that we deforested because we wanted to have a place to live that had far less tree coverage because for some reason, sometimes shrubs and various trees all around your properties can be looked at as a place for more rats or snakes and there's this fear behind it but in my opinion we have to go out of our way to plant more things that are going to mend the soil and create habitat in order to kind of mitigate the damage that we've done to have our homes on these properties as well mm -hmm. so i mean with planting a shoreline area you know there is some selfish motives wanting to get rid of mosquitoes who likes mosquitoes but ultimately it's creating an ecosystem that's going to heal and, and you know, create this beautiful space of biodiversity um, that you can also enjoy in other qualitative ways, like just sitting outside and seeing 50 new species of butterflies that you otherwise wouldn't have if you didn't take that time to plant that area. So you could be a hero every day. Do you have any other last little uh, comments for people who want to do this, but they're scared or intimidated to do something like this themselves? So first off, you might be intimidated by not knowing what's around you. And there's a lot of different resources you can use. You can use your friends who are knowledgeable in plants and wildlife. There's a lot of different apps out there. Like I work on the iNaturalist app to help people identify plants and um, wildlife in their environment. You can use books, you can go to school, you can use your schooling. A lot of schools help you learn how to identify plants and animals. And it's so easy to start. When I did my first native yard, it was an uh, apartment balcony. It was six feet wide by eight feet long. And even with two chairs and a little table out there for me to sit, I had about 20 different plants out there. And I had tons of butterflies. I even had a big spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. This big, which had big googly eye spots and looked like the Caterpie from Pokemon. That's so cool. You could have Pokemon living in your yard. Gotta and catch them all. Exactly. <laughs> Go catch them all. And it starts with native plants, native fish, native wildlife, native Florida. And that's what Stalking Savvy is all about. Mm -hmm. That's what Lee's all about. Well, let's talk uh, a little bit about Stalking Savvy. So where can people find information? Can you talk a little bit about your services and what you do across the state? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a lot easier than just looking for a strange man in khaki wandering the wilderness. You can check out StalkingSavvy.com. You can check out Stalking Savvy on Instagram or Facebook. Um, we also do a lot of social media on YouTube. You can find us through those means. You can also call us at 941-500-2218 or reach out to many of the other businesses that we work with. We work with a wide variety of nonprofits, native plant nurseries, and other businesses across Florida to help restore habitat. And we firmly believe that big issues like climate change, red tide, and habitat loss can be not only reversed, but we can actually make the world better than before we really destroyed large swaths of it. If we were to green the entire sides of buildings, rooftops, we can actually make it so that there was more life on Earth than before we started doing all this habitat loss. We can not only reverse climate change, but literally help to control and influence the weather. Doing rooftop gardens can help cool down entire cities 
and also beautify them and make butterfly gardens. We've actually done floating butterfly gardens in lakes and ponds. They're beautiful, they're gorgeous, and they're muddy to take care of, but that's why you have us. Mm -hmm. Stocking Savvy is here to help restore habitat and help to green all of Florida. Yeah, so if you're upset about the, you know, almost 1,200 manatees that died this past year because of all the nutrient pollution that basically killed off all of the seagrass, you could be a hero by doing projects like planting your shoreline, connecting with Sean, supporting some of the initiatives that he and Stocking Savvy are doing across the state, and by voting for elected officials who also understand the value of these types of projects and want to invest in it. So definitely uh, stay tuned for 2022. It's a big election year. And check out Stocking Savvy. And thank you, Sean, so much thank for coming. Thank you, Lee. Yes. So have a great day. Stay tuned.